Thank you all for coming um, to this uh, lunchtime session. Um, I'm very happy to welcome our two speakers here, uh, Dr. Renaud uh, Egreto, who I've known a very long time, going back to, I don't know, maybe 10 or, 10 or 12 years, Delhi days and then Paris and uh, other places, and uh, Larry Jagan, who of course is very well known in the region and has had great experience here. Um, let me say something a bit more about them, although you've all got the flyer. Uh, Renault uh, is uh, currently research assistant professor with the Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences, and this is at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, before relocating to Hong Kong, he was part-time lecturer um, in comparative politics in Asia and in international relations at Sciences Po in Paris uh, back in 2008-2009. Uh, he's also an associate researcher with the Bangkok-based uh, Institute for Contemporary Research on Southeast Asia um, and has authored two other books uh, before this. Uh, the first one's called Wooing the Generals, India's New Burma Policy, and Online Services and Newspapers on Asian Affairs or from Asia for more than 30 years. Um, he's the Southeast Asia correspondent for uh, The National, which is based in Abu Dhabi, uh, and contributes regularly to the Asia Times, uh, Al Jazeera TV, Bangkok Post, BBC, the BBC World Service, uh, The Daily Star, which is in Dhaka, uh, Radio Free Asia, and Radio and TV Hong Kong. Larry was also the regional news and current affairs editor for Asia and the Pacific at the BBC World Service for more than 10 years, so long innings. Um, they're here um, as part of a uh, book launch and book tour, I guess. Uh, the book is called Soldiers and Diplomacy in Burma, Understanding the Foreign Relations of the Burmese Praetorian State. And there it is. Uh, I think uh, you're the first in Singapore to see the book, which, which is nice. Um, I think you don't have copies for sale no, today. No, sorry. So I'm afraid uh, you're going to keep your change. Um, Anyway, without further ado, I think the uh, drill is that uh, Renault will start us off for about 15 minutes and then hand over the baton to, uh, to Larry. Uh, so we'll do about 30 minutes and then open it up to uh, questions and answers and discussion. Um, Renault, all yours. Thank you, Ganti. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. So thank you to the Ali uh, Kuan Yew School of Public Policy for um, um, hosting us uh, um, this afternoon. I um, would like also to, to thank the, uh, the French Embassy here and the Institut Francais uh, de Singapore as well as Erastake in Bangkok for uh, uh, sponsoring us and, and um, enabling us to, um, to, to come here. So thank you for this, uh, for this invitation. We'd like to offer here a very brief overview of, of our book, of our project uh, on a country uh, that has attracting so much tensions over the past two years, um, well, actually, since the elections uh, of November 2010, um, and for very good reasons, of course. But all this flurry of analysis, of reports, comments that um, have been made about Burma, uh, Burma, Myanmar, it's, there should be uh, no controversy about the, uh, the name. We have a foreword on, on this in our book, but I use intention inten um, uh, Burma and Myanmar. Um, so the, uh, all the reports, the, the comments, the, uh, the analyses that have been made lately about the country, its um, um, political, surprising political evolutions over the past two years, um, have all the more reflected the limited understanding we have of this country, its society, its economy, and above all, its military institution, the Burmese army, the Tamadol. Um, so here we are with this, uh, with this book, which has actually been a, a very long project. It's been 10 years in the making, but we're glad it's finally out. Uh, and we choose to focus on this book on the military institution and most specifically on its influence over the foreign policy, the foreign and security policy making, um, not over the past two years. So if you're looking for um, a book on what has been going on over the past two years, this is not it, but it much explain what, why the Burmese military is still here and is still very much able to influence 
uh, uh, policy making, especially foreign and security policy making. So we go back um, to, um, uh, to, to, to the 1940s so to look at the evolving foreign policies of the country and try to uh, examine the influence uh, uh, that military leaders over the years have had over, this, uh, uh, over the, the country's foreign uh, relations. Um, so we have been so working together for about uh, 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 10 years, so exchanging, interacting, so after dozens of uh, field trips inside and outside the country, um, to, trying to, to, to collect various views um, of the Burmese um, policy actors, um, activists, journalists, um, as well as um, diplomats and foreign observers, especially in Rangoon. Um, so roughly, this book looks at, most specifically, the past 20 years. So, so we've been roughly interviewed people over the past 10 years, but the, the main focus is the, the past uh, uh, 20 years. Um, we ask these basic questions. What has been the role of the army in um, 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 Burma's foreign policy uh, so since 1948? Um, how did it influence the, the, the national security agenda of the country? Um, what are the armies, what have been the armies um, uh, threat perceptions and how those threat perceptions were translated into concrete foreign policy making uh, and decisions? What were, what have been the, uh, the regional implications of this, uh, what we call this Praetorian dominance of the, uh, of the Burmese um, army over the political system of the country? Um, because as it, it shows in the title, we use a specific concept of political science, so the Praetorianism or Praetorian states, which is a pretty old-fashioned concept in, in political science, um, um, especially over the past 20 or th even 30 years um, with the, uh, the, the scholarship on, on civil mil military relations, which has been dominated by uh, uh, democratization studies, transition studies. But back to the if we go back to the 1950s and 60s and 70s, we, um, we, we actually we have used this, this specific um, um, set of ideas um, looking at the influence within the, the channels, the instruments that an army or military institutions have to influence the, uh, 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 the foreign policy making. Um, so what is critical according to this very specific um, 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 conceptual framework, so the Praetorian state and Praetorian, uh, Praetorianism, is that there are degrees of intervention by an army. Uh, so from a direct, blunt uh, military rule to a more sophisticated, quasi-civilian um, administration. So there are therefore different forms of intervention, uh, political intervention, legislative intervention by, by a military institution. And we argue that, uh, and this is the, uh, the, the main focus of our first chapter, that uh, the Burmese army has long acted as a Praetorian institution, but under different patterns since the 1940s. There have been periods of direct military rule, uh, blunt military rule, so from, uh, for instance, from the, uh, uh, the early 60s until, uh, until 1974, uh, and then during the slow SPDC uh, uh, rule until uh, um, three years ago, until 2011. But there have all also been some um, more indirect uh, uh, forms of uh, intervention by the Burmese army, which has been ob observed, especially in the 1970s and 80s, and since 2011. Uh, what we have observed over the past two years, uh, um, so since the... Uh, the uh, transition, um, so from the SPDC to, uh, to the uh, post-Junta era, as, uh, as, we, as we may call it. So if we follow this literature on Praetorianism, is actually a run down uh, the scale of Praetorianism uh, with, uh, so by the Burmese army, um, which has, the, the Burmese army, which has actually, uh, if we can just show you, um, 
what the Burmese army now having really decided, I mean, its leadership decided to, to, to take a back seat. Um, it has secured constitutional immunity. It has secured a specific instrument of intervention, but it's not dominating the whole political system as it used to be uh, during the Slork and SPDC era. Um, it still keep on manipulating so the concept, concept of um, legitimacy. So the, the, the Burmese army leadership still asserts itself as the savior, the protector of the nation, of the constitution, of course, but also of the nation, of the unity of the, of the nation, which is very much what Praetorian armies uh, do. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, it has decided to take a back seat and, and, and not control the, the whole political system, the whole state structure and institution the way it was uh, uh, before or the way it was observed also uh, between 1962 and 1974. So it's a different form of political system uh, that we have and it's, it's actually we argue that we have to understand that it's a different uh, uh, type of rule of, of political military rule that we have today. So it, that, that's why this, is, this, uh, this uh, literature on, on, on the Praetorian state and Praetorianism is quite uh, um, uh, uh, useful. So it's, it's a different system and it's a different type of intervention by the army uh, that, uh, that, we can, um, that we observe now um, um, today. Uh, so hence our book um, title on the, um, on, on the Praetorian state and, and the, um, this adjective that we quite often um, um, use. Um, so we have, so beside this uh, um, conceptual framework, so we have really focused on, on, on Burma's foreign uh, relations and external relations uh, since the 1940s. Um, so the, the post uh, it's really a post-colonial uh, um, concept. So be besides so this Praetorian uh, dominance by the, uh, by the Burmese army, uh, we have identified uh, several um, 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 key elements of, of continuity and change in Burma's colonial foreign policy. Uh, so the, the, the first, of course, is the influence uh, of, the, uh, of the soldiers uh, in, into the foreign policy making. The second one is obvious, and this is something which has not changed and will not change. It's the geography. Burma is, uh, is a geography. It has to deal with it. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's a crossroad, um, so between India, China, uh, Southeast Asia, and the Indian Ocean. For many, it's a blessing because it's open new door, it's a gateway, it opens also new opportunities. But for others, especially within the country, it's also a curse. Uh, it's not necessarily um, um, a boon. And, and as I uh, uh, quote prime, former Prime Minister Unu, um, who in the uh, early 19, in 1950 said that we are hemmed in like a tenor gold among cactus. Uh, they, the, the Burmese have to deal with two rising powers, with the rest of Southeast Asia and with the Indian Ocean uh, and all the strategic um, uh, stakes, as you can see on the map here. Um, so um, this usually security uh, matters and foreign policy matters often propels also um, soldiers into broader policy role. And this is very much the case in uh, in, in, in Burma, so the, uh, the influence of the military is also linked to this sense of strategic sensitivity and, and, and Burma has to deal with this, uh, with these neighbors. We also try in the book to, to link the, uh, the, the, the domestic political conundrum, um, especially the inter-ethnic conflict and the endless uh, civil war, which has uh, implication for all the neighbors, uh, the ethnic groups, at the periphery of, of, of Burma have all um, um, been able to, to, to get access, to get connections beyond the borders. So on the other side, in China, Thailand, um, um, India, Bangladesh as well. Um, so um, we have tried to, uh, to, to understand how uh, the security and foreign policy also was made according to the internal domestic uh, upheav upheavals, and especially the, uh, the, the civil war. Uh, we have also highlighted the, uh, the continuing um, influence that nationalism and, and, and xenophobia have had over the years uh, are over several generations of Burmese leaders, uh, military leaders, but also uh, civilian ones, um, and how this has impacted Burma's relation with the outside world. 
Um, this is much dismissed today. I mean, with the, with the, um, uh, uh, the all those analysis on on uh, Burma opening up, and that it, it's really time to, uh, uh, to 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 rush in and to to get into the country, um, um, and thinking that um, foreigners, foreign investors, diplomats, uh, foreign NGOs will be welcome uh, with open arms by uh, by the Burmese. So we tend to forget that there's very long legacies of, of nationalism and, and, and anti-foreign stance, political stance in, um, in, in, in the country, and that xenophobia and xenophobic nationalism has often been used by military leaders as foreign policy instruments. Uh, and that has not really faded away um, um, these days. And, and finally, we have um, also underlined the, uh, the uh, impact of one of the main characteristics of the Burmese um, political culture, which is the personification of power. Um, policies follow leaders, and, and the uh, um, um, power and politi politics are really personal in, 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 um, in, in, in Burma, and in many other societies in Asia, of course, but it's particularly obvious in the case of, um, of Burma, policy making not only within the military or, or within military circle, but also uh, uh, we can see it in the um, um, in democratic opposition circles, is uh, more than often a top-down uh, process. And personality is often Trump's institution, so they are still a very weak institution in the country. And policy making much depends on the charisma of a, a very few people within the military, of course, but also within the civilian uh, um, uh, sphere. Um, so roughly to uh, to present the uh, the outline of of our book, so that and, and and I'll leave it to Larry after to to give more substance to uh, uh, to that. But the first our first chapter really details our uh, as I said our conceptual framework. So trying to link this notion of Praetorianism and and foreign policy making, uh, we have reviewed the uh, the uh, this uh, the extensive literature on military politics in Burma. Um, and, and try to see how uh, soldiers have influenced uh, uh, the, the foreign service administrations, how soldiers were posted to, uh, to embassies, and how po uh, soldiers influenced the, uh, the, the way, uh, not only security, but uh, the foreign relations were, uh, of the country were uh, uh, defined. Our chapter two then so focuses on the very close linkages between uh, between the post-colonial domestic conundrum and and uh, and the, the foreign uh, relation of the Burmese state in the Cold War context. So first during the uh, the parliamentarian period uh, um, with uh, UNU until 1962, and then during the military regime, uh, with different phases um, uh, that we uh, that we have identified um, and. Actually, as early as the, the late 1940s, uh, national security has, has really, uh, what became of paramount concern uh, to, uh, to the Burmese post-colonial authorities, not only the military, but also the civilian leaders. Um, and um, a, a state-centric, and therefore gradually a military-centric um, uh, foreign policy, so based on domestic security concerns, have been um, uh, shaped in, um, um, in, in the country, so from the, uh, the 1950s, and that we call the uh, securitization of the foreign policy uh, of the country uh, until the end of the, of the Cold War. Then our chapter three and four uh, extend the discussion in the post-Cold War context, so after the, uh, the watershed of 1988 and the, the uprising and the, uh, the, the renewal of the junta in, uh, and, and the military regime so, uh, in, um, uh, after the coup in, uh, in September 1988. Uh, and we uh, note that after, the, uh, the, the, after 1988, the, uh, the military regime tentatively opened up, but then to gradually recalculate and rework its isolation uh, um, posture so has to, to prepare for the uh, the current transition, and, and it took about ten years for the regime to uh, to, to to prepare that uh, that transition, so from a direct rule to a, a post junta era. And for this for this, it it, it needed uh, to to withdraw from the international and regional scene. And that's at that time that time that Nepido, the new capital, was built. At the time that the uh, the regime not only was shunned by the outside world with the sanction policies from the Western countries, especially, but 
also decided from its own will to, uh, to withdraw from the regional and the international scene, mostly to prepare its, uh, 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 its, its own um, uh, transforma internal transformation and, and the, the current transition. Uh, chapter four narrows more specifically the analysis on the China-India uh, um, thing. I mean, uh, with this um, uh, very uh, blunt question, is there really a rivalry between the two countries emerging uh, uh, in and around Burma? And, and we actually try, uh, contrary to, to most observation, to, to, to tone down a bit this idea of, of a great game really taking shape in the, in the country, mostly because the Chinese are there, but the Indians are not. Uh, I mean, not in, uh, as influential as, as, um, as we think they are in the, in the country for many uh, historical reasons and, and, and geostrategic one as well. So we try to turn down this allegory on, on the Sino-Indian great game in, uh, in Burma. And finally, chapter five questions, so the uh, re-entering of of Burma into regional and global uh, uh, politics in, uh, 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 now, in, in, in the uh, 2010s. Uh, the role of the ASEAN, the role uh, of the West, uh, trying to, uh, to uh, um, uh, revisit the, uh, the place of Burma in the region, in the world. Um, and, um, um, and, and we are asking in our conclusion whether Burma is really about to normalize. Uh, uh, its relation with the outside world and uh, uh, rejoin the, uh, the international community. So I leave it to Larry to, uh, to, to give a bit more substance to, uh, to our talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm unashamedly a journalist, so, so my approach <coughs> is a little bit different. Um, uh, instead, instead of theoretical uh, models, I use anecdotes uh, to examine uh, what's actually going on uh, in, in Burma. And I'm afraid I, I still haven't changed from, from using Burma to Myanmar, although I'm in the process of it. <coughs> I've used Burma for more than 40 years, which was, uh, uh, in fact, when I first tried to go to Burma, uh, and was refused at that time as well. Um, so it, 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 uh, old habits die hard, uh, <coughs> which, of course, is something that's very, very much part of the Burmese military approach. Old habits die very hard. My first boss at the BBC, uh, Burmese service, uh, said to me, the one thing you have to remember about Burma is that we will never be able to predict when change comes. And that's largely been true. Uh, most journalists and analysts like myself, we haven't often been right in terms of predicting things. And when change comes, it will come a lot more quickly than you expect. Uh, and I think, I think that is, is the lesson of what has happened since March uh, uh, 2011. Um, having said that, um, it, it is very important to understand the mentality of the Burmese military, uh, because even today it is dominating the way in which uh, things are framed. Um, it is a transitional society, uh, no doubt about it, and even more importantly, it's a transitional political system where uh, the, the, the juxtaposition of civilianization and military control is still there. Um, we, we, we don't always see it, uh, but it, it is there. Um, and I think it's important uh, to, 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 to um, reflect on what the key element of the military mindset is. Uh, and for me, a salutary lesson was in 2003 when I travelled with the deputy head of military intelligence in the Shan area, looking at what was happening to uh, <coughs> drug production and, and so on. And uh, we spent 10 days with other Burmese journalists. I was the only foreign journalist allowed in. Um, very few times that I was actually allowed in when others weren't. Most of the time I've not been allowed in and others have been. Um, and we, we got quite drunk uh, the, the last day of the, the, uh, the tour, and, and, and I said to Major General Joe Wynn, I said, uh, look, what happens if Kinyon rings you up and says, Larry knows too much, um, we can't let him out of the country, or we have to silence him? Instinctively, he said, you're dead. <laughs> but you like me, we get on, we drink, yeah? it doesn't matter. My, my superior gives me an order, I carry it out instinctively. 
I've had the same kind of experience in, in the Philippines where, when I was dealing with the military regime there. And, of course, they would, they would be much more polite. They would say, well, we'll, we'll give you two hours' notice. There'd be a nod and a wink. Uh, whether, whether that would happen or not is another matter. But for the Burmese, it was instinctive. Uh, and I think the other thing which an old, old friend of mine who's a very uh, uh, the second generation of, of Burmese generals said, <coughs> in Burma, loyalty in the army is loyalty for life. It doesn't end when you leave the army. You are loyal to your superiors. And I think it's, it's very important uh, to understand that because that's what we're seeing in Napidor. Uh, because many of the ministers are still former generals uh, they still have loyalty. They have loyalty to one particular person, <coughs> and it's not Aung San. Um, it, it's Tan Shui. Uh, and, and they're fighting hard to try and, and, and change that. So there, there is a schizophrenia. Um, you know, someone like So Thane, naval commander, and of course the Navy was always much more liberal uh, than the Army, is, is, is uh, theoretically um, in charge of uh, economic development and, and promoting the country abroad. <coughs> I have to say, I think that one of the reasons he is is his English is extremely good, whereas most of the ministers, uh, because of Nawin's anti uh, or, or pro Burmese uh, language, uh, didn't allow English to be taught. Um, and, and so most of the ministers uh, are not very proficient. So Thane was one of the last to be, to be trained in Britain. Uh, I met, met him years and years ago when he was a, a, a cadet in the, in the Naval College in, uh, in, in Britain. So um, th there is this balance. There is no doubt that Tain Sein is trying to move from um, an old military government, uh, in, in, I mean it's a new old military government, trying to move it to a civilian uh, administration. Uh, we've seen increased numbers of civilians being brought into government, usually at de deputy minister level. Um, and, and again, it's very interesting talking to some of these deputy ministers. Um, they say uh, they cannot do anything unless the minister ordains it. Uh, I mean, they've been brought in because they're, they know, they're usually businessmen. You know, Winston said on. Uh, they're there to put their expertise and experience into practice, but there's still some old military codger above them that has to give them the approval before they can go ahead. For me, another salutary lesson was Ong Min, a general, a former General Ong Min, who was Minister for Railways and, as all everyone knows, has been the key person in promoting the ceasefire agreements. He's been negotiating with the ethnic groups. Um, in, in the first big meeting was in Chiang, Ma, Chiang Rai in November uh, 2011. And he told me, he stopped talking to me after this actually, but he told me then, I went to see Tan Shui first. Bef to, to get his approval before I started this process of peace negotiations. So it, it, the, the, the old guard are still there, uh, even if they're not physically running things, and in some cases they are. And, and that's why, you know, uh, <coughs> a plug for the book, understanding the military mindset, you will, you will get it in this book. It may not be about contemporary matters, but everything that you can read there has implications for what's going on now. Um, for me, uh, thing, things are going to ch continue to change rapidly, I think, between now and 2015. Uh, but the key thing that I'm interested in is the role of the army. Um, it, it has not gone away. Um, uh, and uh, certainly, it's receded. Its influence has receded. In some areas, it hasn't. Uh, border areas, the ceasefire agreements, uh, they're the ones who, they're the obstacles uh, to, to, uh, to, to some of the agreements. Um, so they're, they're still there. So it's interesting to try and get a feel for where the army is going. And again, I think there's a schizophrenia uh, with, within the current army leadership, Min Ong Line and others. Um, they, they would like to be a professional army. They, 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 not Min Ong Line, I haven't had access to him yet, but some of the others that I speak to tell me we messed it up. You know, they, they're well aware that after 1988 to 2010, what wasn't, wasn't really a glorious page in Burmese military history. Um, they, they are not good administrators, and they, they admit that. 
uh, privately, of course. I can never quote them. Um, but they do, they do want to be a professional army. Um, and, and, and they want to resume where they were before 88. The army today is very different to the army in 88. In 1988, the army was an elite army. Uh, the sons and daughters of the elite joined the army. Um, you had to go through uh, stringent entrance exams. Uh, and I, some of my friends who are now actually <coughs> Uh, advisors to the government failed those exams and said, God, we've got to look for a job now. We're, we're not going into the army. We're not going to become uh, um, a, 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 an officer. Uh, the army today is made up of, of, of <coughs> what the Americans would call grunts. You know, these are people who, many of, the, many of them conscripted, have gone up the ranks. So they are not, they are not um, the elite. Um, same kind of thing went through when happened uh, in, in China in the, in the People's Liberation Army. Uh, um, so so the, the top of the army now would like to have the kind of training and kind of position uh, status that they had before. Uh, and so they want, they want to open up um, uh, opportunities for them to study uh, at, at, at all the prestigious uh, defence colleges throughout the world, America and Britain in particular, of course, uh, Duntroon in Australia. Uh, and, and they know that, that the only way they can do that is, is, is by further reducing their political control, uh, by, by stepping f further back from the political arena. It's still, it's still a struggle. It's a dialectic, if you like. Um, and, and, and it hasn't been resolved yet. Um, and I would, <coughs> uh, I have to say, I, I have to follow my advice. I'm not going to make predictions because I'll probably be wrong uh, whether, whether I predict they will or they won't. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, but there's no doubt that this struggle is, is, is taking place. Um, the, the, the key thing, of course, is the army doesn't trust, soldiers do not trust civilians. Uh, they, they do not trust civilians. Um, and, and so th there, there is, there's a baggage. Um, they understand that civilians can bring advantages, um, uh, but, but uh, they don't trust them. Um, and they feel that they're the only institution that actually has the national interest of the country at heart. They're the only ones that don't have a vested interest. And if you look back at the history, 1958, you know, Parliament, the first Parliament, uh, it was chaos. You know, there was fighting, there was literally fighting in the corridors of, of Parliament. And UNU invited Nguyen to come in and take over the army and take over the running of the country um, because they, they, there was so much dissension. So this, this kind of suspicion of politicians uh, is, is still there. Um, and, and it'll take a while for that to, uh, uh, to, to lessen. Um, I think, though, the other thing that's happening, I mean, obviously, in the Constitution, the Army's role in government is, is, is enshrined. Um, uh, they have the Defence Ministry. They have the, Nas the Border Affairs Ministry. They have the Interior Ministry. And since the civilianisation of government, since Tain Sein came to power, they have taken over Telecoms. Uh, it's no accident that the new minister, after after the minister was sacked for corruption, uh, was 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 a general, um, because the army sees telecoms as a strategic industry that they need to be in control of. Uh, reminded me of of, of uh, <coughs> um, almost ten years ago in Bangkok when uh, Thaksin uh, sold AIS to uh, to Singapore. That brought his downfall. Because it was then that the elite said, "He's selling out our interests." I mean, even if we, can, you know, even if they, you thought you could trust Singapore, uh, the fact that some national, uh, other other than than Thais, were in control of telecoms was a betrayal. The Thai, the, the the Burmese have have army has the same kind of approach. So, uh, and, and lastly, you know, why do we look at foreign policy? Um, uh, it's it's. Foreign policy is an essential part of strategic security as far as the Burmese army is concerned. Um, I remember in the, in the mid-90s when I was given <coughs> limited access, that was 
three weeks in 1994 to Burma um, when Bill Richardson was coming to see Aung San Suu Kyi when she was under, under house arrest. And so I was talking to Ken Yunt and, and uh, Jo Win and Jo Thane about um, uh, just where, where the country was going. Um, and and, and uh, they said, you know, what we had to do after the 1990 elections, we understood that we were going to become a pariah state. They knew what was going to happen. Um, and so we started by telling the foreign ministry, you have to get us into all the regional organisations. We want to go back to NAM, we want to join ASEAN, uh, whatever it is, let's get in so we can get some friends. Uh, it wasn't friends for the sake of friends, uh, from their it was security. We need to protect ourselves. So foreign policy is a very important way, I believe, uh, otherwise we wouldn't, wouldn't have written the book in the way that we did, uh, to, to actually look at the military interest. Um, how is it going to change? Uh, and I think that's the interesting thing. Um, it was... It, it, the, the strength of Chinese influence was necessity from the Burmese point of view. Um, you know, the military intelligence people I spoke to always said to me, it's your fault that we're in the hands of the Chinese. If you didn't impose sanctions, we wouldn't be in the hands of the Chinese. We had to go. Um, uh, so th th that, that gave me a sense that <coughs> actually, you know, th th there is a strong sense of nationalism uh, and, and you couldn't call them pro-China. Um, what we've also seen since, since 2011 is that the more liberal, the most liberal uh, members of government, Ong Min, So Thane, are vitriolically anti-China uh, in private. Uh, they, 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 they are worried about the over, over dominance of, the, of China in the country. No accident that Tain Sein woke up one day and said Mitsona is not going ahead. Uh, my source who's an advisor to, the, to him so said <coughs> all these demonstrations were starting uh, against Mitsona and against the Chinese and he thought and, and, and Parliament was about to debate uh, the Mitsona dam so he thought he'd better read the agreement and he read the agreement um, and 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 said 80% of the electricity from Mitsona Dam is going to China? No way. And it was that that, that, that that stopped it. It's also, for me, it was also something interesting about Tain Sein. Uh, he's not anti-China. He's not happy with China because his advisors have told me that when he goes to Beijing, he gets treated like a teenager, a wayward teenager. They tell him what to do. Um, it's almost, you know, you're going to be kept in, uh, you know, <coughs> um, uh, you're going to lose your, your privileges of going out if, if you don't do what we say. But um, so it's, personally, he, he has some tension, but he's, he's, he's much more open, open minded. And I, I, he understood that if he didn't do something s strategic, that there was going to, there was a danger of, of mass anti-Chinese demonstrations around an issue that was of strategic importance, the Mid-Zone Dam, the, the electricity. And so this was a way uh, of cutting off the possibility of that, ki that kind of protest at that time. Uh, so people who, who tell me Tain Sein is not strategic, um, I don't believe them. I think he's extremely strategic. Is, is, is he adventurous? No, no. Um, is, he, is he slow? I mean, not in an intellectual, but, you know, in terms of moving, absolutely. But that's the Burmese way, you know. Um, uh, uh, um, but so, so there is, there is an anti-China um, uh, feeling. Um, I mean, the Chinese keep asking me, you know, are, are they, are they pro-India? Uh, no, no, I don't think they're pro-India. It's, it's just that they are worried about the over-dominance of China. Um, and as a result, in my view, what we're seeing evolve is uh, an ASEAN first foreign policy. And talking to some of Tain Sein's advisors, it's a very conscious move, ASEAN first. Because in a way, it, co it, it goes back to, uh, in a modern way, to the, to the non-aligned movement. If you don't want to be pro-India or pro-China or pro-the US in one camp, what's the best place to be? And you're in there already, ASEAN. So I, th I, I think 
the, the, the regime um, wants to strengthen its, its relationships with ASEAN. And, we, and we're seeing it in all sorts of different ways, although not in a public. You know, the number of, de of, of, of um, uh, trainers that, and, and courses that are being put on for Burmese government officials. Um, I, when I get back to Bangkok, I'm involved in one uh, teaching uh, senior MFA uh, officials how to deal with the media. Because after all, 2014, they're going, it's the, 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 they're going to be uh, the, the chairman of ASEAN. So, and and they, they have been coming to Singapore and to Thailand in particular, uh, and to some extent Indonesia, asking for help, and, uh, rather than China and India. So, so I think we are going to see um, an ASEAN first uh, approach. Um, and just to finish on the, 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 um, the unpredictable, you know, could we have seen what was going to happen? I think we could have. Um, in 2006, when, when Gambari first went to uh, Burma, and the first time he met uh, Tan Shui, uh, they had a long conversation, and Tan Shui said, you should talk to Tain Sein. He's the man you need to talk to. He's going to be around. I'm not. Now, all right, it, 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 it took another four years before Tan Shui. This is the thing about the Burmese. They don't do things quickly. Uh, but they do, when they start to, they do. But uh, he, he'd already planned his exit and, 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 and was quite happy to see um, some kind of uh, reform. Um, uh, just, just one last anecdote and I promise I'll finish there <coughs> I spoke to, to, to sources of mine in Tan Shui's office back uh, before 2004 um, and they said you know Tan Shui does not trust Kin Yunt yeah, well, different view I mean I, I was writing things about the, the differences of opinion between the two he said, no. He thinks Kin Yunt is a hothead. He thinks he, he, he makes snap judgments. And I thought, good heavens. You know, that's the most frightening thing I've heard about Burma. Uh, that Kin Yunt is, 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 is um, um, what's the word? I mean, <coughs> too quick to change. Because I, I, my, my feeling about Kin Yunt was the opposite. But Tan Shui is obviously even worse. So th they, are not, they, are, they are not quick uh, quick. Uh, qu they, they, their, their inclination is not to change. And I have to say, and this is final, fine, fine, is that Dor Su is exactly the same. I've spoken to her over many, uh, many, many years, uh, and I, I had two and a half hours with her, just the two of us in December last year, and, and she has the same kind of Burmese concern. Um, we have to, hers is a slightly more different. Yeah? We have to get it right. We have to be certain before we move down the road to change. Uh, or, or, or particular kind of change. Um, so the next, the next two years in particular, but the next 10 years, are going to be fascinating for any of you who are interested in Burma watching. <coughs> I've done it for more than 40 years, and I'll probably be continuing to do it, perhaps not for another 40 years, but certainly another 10. Thank you. Um, we've got 30 minutes. Uh, let me open it up uh, for questions. Uh, would be quite nice. I think we're recording it, so if you could say who you are very briefly as well. And of course, keep the, the questions uh, or comments fairly brief so that they have time to respond. Got one right there? Yeah. Hi, I'm Lincoln from the Institute of South Asian Studies here at uh, the US. I have two questions I guess, for the speakers. Uh, Larry mentioned uh, rightly that there was a certain sense in which we could have predicted this uh, where we are now because we followed, there was some meticulousness in which we followed the seven path, uh, just this being different, uh, facilitated at some point. So the interesting thing now is the, there is no further roadmap for uh, the following. And where do they go from here? Uh, maybe that's a vast question, but uh, if you could come in more specifically on what does this mean for the international community in dealing with it? Does this open more space uh, for them to maneuver, or is it uh, going to be more difficult because there's no uh, formal path? My second question is 
it's uh, in terms of the sense that you get from the military or the rule or the ruling uh, current ruling regime, if there is any difference between the two. In the in terms of what they expect countries, particularly India, Japan, and ASEAN, to do or what they can do more, I uh, maybe specifically in terms of in terms of its uh, balancing the tight embrace from China or independent of that. Thank you. Okay. Um, why don't you do? Uh, <coughs> Yeah, I think rather than take a bunch of questions, why don't you... Yeah, sure. Uh, well, <coughs> uh, let me talk about the, the roadmap. Uh, uh, you know, the roadmap, as far as I was co I'm concerned, was something that was imposed on Burma ra rather than something that, was, that, were, that, 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 that developed out of, out of Burma uh, or, or from the Burmese elite. It's not that they weren't thinking plans, uh, but, but, you know, it, 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 first of all, it was Rosali... Uh, the, the the UN envoy who who discussed uh, roadmaps. I mean, how in practical terms, how do we move towards uh, uh, some kind of interim government and so on? Um, they understood that there had to be benchmarks. There had there had to, there had to be a vision. I mean, because they're, they're not uh, they're not opposed to that. Um, the Burmese attitude, the Burmese military attitude, is to have several plans, several roadmaps: Plan A, Plan B, and so on. But th they were quite prepared to 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 have it nailed down to one. Um, and, and of course, Dr. Surakit, uh, when he was Thai Prime Minister, uh, Foreign Minister, uh, was was key in in, in getting uh, this discussion going. Um, uh, so, so, you know, I I I I think the roadmap, in some ways. Uh, is a way that we from the outside look at it. Um, I remember talking to Win Ong, the, then the foreign minister in 2003 at the Bali summit, uh, and we had breakfast, and he said, Larry, look, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a seven-step roadmap, but, but don't expect it to take seven years. Um, this is 2003. Um, and, and uh, you know, what we found is it's much more difficult uh, to achieve uh, the first steps than we expected. Uh, 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 it'll get a lot. It'll get a lot faster. Well, it it didn't. Uh, uh, I, uh, however, the the point that you're making, what appears now, I mean, up until 2010 or up until March 2011, although we didn't pre predict how quickly, many people just didn't believe Tan Shui would leave the scene and so on. There was a pattern there. We, it, it, you know, with the sort of um, uh, with the hindsight of history, we could see it. Now there's no plan. There's no strategy, and the problem is that it's incredibly ad hoc. Um, uh, there is so much for Burma to do, uh, for the government to do. They don't know what to do first. There are no pra there's no priority. There's no national plan, uh, and and their advisors are telling them this is what you should do. And so w w whatever is possible. Uh, whatever, wherever they can get quick gains. So telecoms has become a major issue because this is this is somewhere where they could get quick gains. So th you're absolutely right. It's it's much more chaotic. Um, we, we're not able to, to predict, and therefore it is much more difficult for the international community. Um, uh, and, and and I think it you know the international community. What worries me, and I, I've I've written about this. What worries me is that you know. There's so much aid and, and, and so on sort of a bit building up that, that World Bank, ADB, uh, bilateral from Australia, that they want to shove into, into, into Burma. Uh, and, and the important thing for me is that the Burmese should decide what the priorities are. I do not want to see a replication in Burma of what happened in Cambodia. Um, I think the nationalism in, in, in Burma will, will mitigate against it. So yes, it's, it's difficult. Um, and 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 uh, yeah, um, and unfortunately, and this is where the mindset: there is only one person the international community can talk to for any realistic assessment, and that's Tain Sein. Some things haven't changed. Uh, the hierarchy is still there. I mean, you could talk at lower level and expect it to go up, which didn't happen before. Now, if you if you want to really um, you know, engage and, 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 and have an interjection, it's at the very top. And he's got so much on his plate. So it, I, it, it is difficult. Indeed, and I think that we'll, actually we're going back to the 1950s. Uh, not only as far as the domestic 
politics are concerned. But also, uh, you were mentioning India and uh, the ASEAN and, and, and the willingness of the of the Burmese to to balance and counter with China. This is very much what happened in the 1950s. So uh, the Burmese, the elites, not only the military elite, but the elite as, as a whole, are willing to, to get advice, trainings, some sort of investment also from the outside world, but not to become the, the pawn of another one, uh, not to, uh, not to uh, uh, um, I mean, trade China for the United States or India, or we should not forget this, what we call the legacies of, of, of xenophobia and nationalism, as Larry said. It's, it's, it's something which is very much here. I mean, the, the foreigners, everything which is foreign is, is suspicious, uh, um, including foreign investments. I mean, uh, the, the Burmese have not been great capitalists. Uh, uh, capitalism has been brought by the, by, by the Indians, by the Chinese, including during the colonial era. Um, so uh, there's this suspicion and, and, and the fear of anything which is foreign. But now, like in the 1950s, it seems that most of the elites welcome the, the assistance, the, uh, the aid from India, from ASEAN, uh, because there's so much to do, so much to, to learn. And, 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 but like in the 50s, it's not because you welcome advice and suggestions, it's not because you try to open, to open up that the, uh, 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 the, the, the situation is... is, is, is uh, rosy and, 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 and we'll probably see some sort of replication of what happened in the 1950s, uh, which is quite, uh, well, it's not really a positive uh, assessment. <laughs> Uh, I mean, just briefly on your on your second question, because it you know it it it's it's it, it's a very complicated issue, uh, and um, we don't have time to to discuss it in full. And secondly, um, it, it policy at the moment in 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 Napidor is instinctive and ad hoc, and and so. Uh, I personally haven't done enough talking to people to be able to give you a definitive answer, but but I, I have a, I, I'm quite convinced that the the ASEAN I mean the, the approach is is twofold. One, it is to balance the the, the major powers around them, uh, but secondly, I think they are convinced that their future is in is in ASEAN, um, and and after all. You know, it's, we're not talking about the 1990s. This is an ASEAN that has good relations with China and India. Um, and, 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 and so um, they, they're going to get the best of both worlds by being, by being within ASEAN. Japan, I think they're much more ambivalent uh, about Japan. But the, th the, thi the thing about the Burmese now <coughs> is they are grateful to, to anyone uh, who offers them uh, what they regard as appropriate assistance. Um, and Japan was the first to, to, to come in after 2011. You know, the, the, the West was slow in getting rid of sanctions. They still haven't. Uh, and so there is a gratefulness. But, but, but I don't believe that, that the, they're moving towards Japan uh, because, because of the, 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 because of China. In fact, I think, I think they're worried about being too close to China because of the possible Beijing reaction. Okay, I have two. Uh, it's Adam and then uh, Lady in the corner. Hello, I'm Adam I'm from Sri Lanka and studying in the Department School. Uh, my question is relating to what you have worked and uh, what you said about the... Can you speak up a bit so they can... Uh, Burmese nationalism. I mean, is it so much Burmese nationalism or Burman uh, majoritarian assertiveness all the other ethnic groups of the Shans and the Karens and so on, because I don't think we don't touch uh, uh, much on those aspects. And also whether the, uh, the, the you see that there is this uh, nexus between the military and the Buddhist clergy in, in, a, in a kind of a compact. And I just wonder about the recent spurt of violence uh, targeting the Muslims in particular. And uh, in retrospect, do you think that the US and EU have been too quick to remove sanctions? Because don't you think that if they want to have a truly democratic state, it can't be a majoritarian uh, imposition that uh, all uh, ethnicities, all people belong to all religions should have equal rights? Okay, let's take the other one, I think, and then you can answer both. Oh, yes. Okay. Because time's running out. For um, very short answer, I think that the 
very interesting presentation by the Melissa Crouch on from the law faculty. My question is similar or perhaps follows on from the last one. Um, I was very interested to hear uh, the mention about anti-Chinese sentiment and the response of, of the military in that regard. Um, but I wondered if you could address the issue of the anti-Muslim sentiment um, and the, the policy of the military towards um, the conflict, particularly in relation to the Muslims, whether that has changed at all over the years, whether what we're seeing now in terms of the state of emergency and the increased presence of the military in these areas is any different to the past or not. Thank you. We're running out of time, yeah. so I want to give them. Okay, I just want to get their feedback on uh, why now uh, Aung San Suu Kyi has been rather reticent about the violence and uh, particular the Rohingyas and so on, because they have been basically the same country. I think if I might ask both of you to link some of these up to the foreign policy yeah. issue, particularly because it's not a, a session really on all the developments within Burma. But anyway. Okay. Um, yes, we, indeed, in our book, we, that's why we're using Burma, Burmese, and Burman. So really, to make the distinction between the Burma, so the Burman, uh, uh, and especially the nationalism, which is really a Burma nationalism, uh, Buddhist based, um, and which has long been used as really as a political instrument. Uh, including in foreign policy. Um, um, but uh, um, it's, still, it's still very much there, um, uh, not only among the military, but also among the, uh, uh, the, the people and, and the anti-Muslim st stance, which was initially more an anti-India stance, I mean, the colonial and really the, the, the Indian at large. But now it has far more turned towards Islamophobia rather than Indophobia. Um, and, and, but it's still very much there and it's still very much a policy concern. And this is why it's very difficult for the new regime to, uh, uh, to, 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 to define a clear-cut policy. Um, um, the police is now far more involved in, into security uh, um, things at the local level. It's, uh, the army just wants to step in as the, uh, uh, um, the institution that can bring back order. But on the day-to-day -day basis now, it's really the police that is uh, uh, um, um, uh, dealing with all the, uh, uh, um, the flare-ups and all the, the, the riots. And it's, it's, it's not uh, done the way it used to be done with the military uh, during uh, um, um, on the policy, uh, uh, security policy. Um, do, do you want to? Do yeah. uh, <laughs> I sort of feel like Aung San Suu Kyi myself now because uh, <laughs> um, uh, I'm not going to be, give, be able to give you an answer that you will be happy with. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's no doubt that, that uh, within the Buddhist uh, Sangha, there has long been an anti-Muslim attitude. I mean, I covered uh, the, 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 the problems in 2001 when a Muslim family, 16, died in near Mandalay when a house was burnt down. I was given by a very close friend of mine who was, who's a devout Buddhist, but <coughs> it lived in the West for a while, a tract that had been written by a very important monk um, in, in Rangoon, which was basically a diatribe against against Muslims. Um, and and the, the thing that I remember was one line that said, uh, remember Malaysia. 2,000 years ago, it was a Buddhist country. Uh, now now it's not. Um, uh, so so it's that, that, that kind of um, suspicion, resentment is, is there. It's also in the army. Uh, I mean, that, that, there is, there is the, all Muslims, very, or very, very few Muslims in the army now, but there are Chinese. Uh, I mean, there's still a, gla glass, um, a glass ceiling, but, but, but th th there has been uh, some promotions. Um, it, it, it's, it's a very complicated issue that we're not going to be able to give justice to. Um, but uh, I, I, do, I do think that the army has been complicit in some of the violence in some of the areas, uh, more so in Arakan than, than, than the, 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 the conflicts in Metila. Um, but at the same time, one of the problems has been the old mindset. Um, a close friend of mine who's the MP for Metila, Wintain, I spoke to him uh, the day the violence took place in Metila back, back in March, and he said, Larry, you know, the police stood by they did nothing. And I went and asked them, why aren't you doing anything? We haven't had orders, sir. 
Uh, so, so there, there is there is this kind of thing. So it's it's complicated. Um, should should the, I mean I'm still not convinced that the West has removed sanctions. I'm afraid um, uh, American businessmen I talk to certainly don't believe sanctions have been properly lifted as yet. Um, I, I, I've, I I think it's very it's it's it, it's it's sort of grasping at straws to say they shouldn't lift sanctions before there's no violence or there's before there's national reconciliation. Um, I, 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 would like to, I would like to see them uh, differentiated. That's not to say that what's happening in terms of the social the community and disruption isn't important. It, it's very important. And that the international community has to intervene in a way. Or, uh, but it should, it, it, you know, it, it should be to help rather than, than scold. Um, uh, just finally on Aung San Suu Kyi, I feel sorry for her. Um, she's been condemned for not saying anything. I think I, I, her biggest problem is that she has no one to advise her. She's actually very lonely. She has a lot of people talking to her. American embassy, American ambassador, the British ambassador, all, all, all there telling her things, but she has no confidants. Um, no one telling her what's really going on in, in the country. And when I, after my two and a half hours meeting in December, I felt, she knows less about what's going on in Burma now than when she was under house arrest, when she could listen to, the, to, to all the Burmese services. Um, I think part of her reluctance is, is, is um, she just doesn't know what to say, um, and she's scared she'll get it wrong. But that's a personal view. Yeah, it was interesting. I was just thinking that, I mean, of course, uh, the Muslim, uh, anti-Muslim riots, I mean, one of the possible links to foreign policy is that if uh, Myanmar, Burma is uh, interested in, in an ASEAN-led foreign policy, I mean, there's Malaysia, there's Indonesia, at least there are three Muslim countries in ASEAN, and whether that's going to impact the relationship over time if they don't get it right uh, and deal with the Muslim problem. But j uh, just a point there, that when you look at Thailand or Indonesia, these two countries also have their own problems and inter-religious problems in mm. southern Thailand, uh, in Indonesia with uh, uh, the Hamadiyya uh, minority also. It's not because you have um, inter-religious conflict that the international community or the ASEAN doesn't deal with you yeah. um, or, or impose sanctions on, uh, on you. So we can very much have the same type of uh, uh, foreign policy approach with, yeah. uh, with Burma. I mean, you're right that ASEAN yeah. generally stays away from domestic issues, yes, but, it, but, but whether that will always be the case, yeah. I wonder. But well, I, I was going to say, rather than pointing the finger at Aung San Suu Kyi, I would point the finger at ASEAN uh, for, 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 for having been so, particularly Indonesia, Malaysia and Brunei, for being so quiet on what's going on in Arakan. In, in 1990, 1991, uh, when, when, when the, the flow of refugees uh, from, from Arakan in, into, into Bangladesh, uh, they, were, they were instrumental in getting the UN involvement and, and getting them negotiated. So, I mean, they, they, they can play both sides, uh, sides of the field, as it were, uh, and I think, I think they have been um, uh, remiss. But the, yeah. Mostly because it was an international problem at that time, and uh, now it's maybe a domestic issue, so it's non-interference. I mean, just uh, a quick uh, footnote sorry. to all, everything yeah. you say. Uh, the effects of the riots uh, uh, and the violence in Burma had an impact in India, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because there's a Hindu-Muslim issue there, mm -hmm. and of course in Bangladesh as well. So what's happening in Burma uh, isn't just a Southeast Asian problem. It has echoes also from <coughs> other countries. Anyway. Can, just Let, very quickly, um, <coughs> uh, just so it, 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 what's happening in Arakan absolutely has a South Asian dimension. Mm -hmm. The Indians keep asking me, is, is, is Pakistan involved? Well, can, can you get information on the Pakistani involvement? Well, that yeah, would be interesting. <laughs> yes? Thank you. Actually, my question, uh, my name is Helen. I'm from the Patterson School of Diplomacy in the United States, just a visitor. But um, my question was about Pakistan, actually, in the military in Pakistan. So many of the things that you said today have drawn very close parallels to what has happened uh, in Pakistan with the military and, and their nationalism and then also what it's fed into in foreign policy with China, relationship with China, and also the cross-border flows. So I was wondering if you could comment or if you had thought, um, I'm sure you thought of it, but the, the similarities and the differences between the military's role uh, within the nations and then in foreign policy. Yeah, actually, if I could add on to that, because that was my question yeah. too. <laughs> the Pakistanis have made different strategic choices, which is in mm -hmm. fact to ally mm -hmm. quite closely with the United States, China, and to a much more kind of 
worldly foreign policy out there engage with people, uh, other countries, whereas Burma chose a completely different route, although, as you point out, it has a very, the military has a very self-conscious guardian role and all of that, just like in Pakistan. And also in terms of accepting aid, what Pakistan's done with aid, etc. Yeah. Okay. Well, in, indeed, actually, it, unfortunately, Burma has been put in the Southeast Asian box. So we often compare it to Indonesia or Thailand or the Philippines in, as far as the transition and as far as the, uh, the military politics are concerned. But Burma owes much to South Asia, I mean, it was part of the British Raj, so most of its institutions, of course, are uh, quite similar. And, and it offers the perfect symmetry also uh, with Pakistan, India, China, the Indian Ocean. Um, and um, yeah, we, we mentioned this parallel in, in, in our book. And, and it's, it's, it's why we use also the Praetorian uh, thing, it's, um, um, because very much Pakistan is a Praetorian state, uh, um, still. Uh, and um, um, yeah, the parallels are very interesting. Uh, but the, uh, I would say that, well, I'm not that uh, an expert on Pakistan, but I would say that nationalism is not, is not the same. I mean, in, in, in Burma, the, uh, the legacies are quite different. Uh, uh, the, um, although the ethnic issue also might, might be, uh, we can draw a parallel on, the, on that, but uh, when, especially when there were the East and West Pakistan, um, um, so exactly the same issue with the dominating Punjabi um, um, uh, ethnic group, um, uh, like the Burman ethnic group in, um, in, in, in Burma. So yes, uh, um, probably we'll have to look at to, towards Pakistan to see what Burma could uh, look like in, in 10 or 15 years, whether than Indonesia or, or Thailand or the Philippines. Yeah. Uh, um, but just very quickly, I mean, as a journalist, I don't like making uh, cross-country uh, uh, comparisons. Um, uh, and, and, and I've been in a position where I've followed Pakistan, and particularly Bangladesh, uh, for almost as long as I've followed uh, Burma. And, and certainly there are parallels and, and there are... There are differences. I, I would have thought in some ways it's more parallels with Bangladesh than, than, than Pakistan. As for me, Pakistan was always part of the international um, um, global uh, network. I mean, it's pro-American position. The Burmese were, were, were consciously isolationist. To some extent, uh, so, so was Bangladesh. Sure, there are things we can learn. There are, there are parallels we can draw. Uh, it, it's interesting, um, uh, <coughs> and that's what theses are probably made of. Um, I'm afraid I can't fit it into a thousand words. <laughs> okay, uh, a question there. Um, this is a question. I just want to add, I'm Fermi. My name is Beth. So, of all of you to discuss um, with regards to Rohingya and religion, there's one angle that I want to point out to you, which is uh, immigration. We have a huge immigration net. So, hence, we have this, um, I mean, okay, Rohingya or Muslim, there is a bit of uh, religious element to it. But at the same time, there is also immigration issue, which could happen to the Chinese as well as the um, Thais. So please do not forget that part. So if you take um, this these issues as uh, religious, you're going to have a huge instability in the region as well. So please consider um, the um, immigration element as well, because we have immigrants, uh, economic immigrants, or political immigrants, or whatever reason, in other countries as well. So, you know, consider that as well. And recently, um, in Burmese, because of the ripple effect of the, what happened in Burma, the Burmese been uh, murdered in Malaysia and elsewhere. So, you know, do not forget the immigration part. Thank you. Can, can I just say, you know, it, 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 immigration is only part of the issue. I mean, there are traditional Muslim communities in, in, in Burma, but uh, as Renault was, was mentioning, also in Thailand, and we, we have a desperate situation in southern Thailand. I think actually much worse than anything that's happened in Burma uh, in, this year, and I don't see the international outcry, I don't see the international press, including myself, covering it because editors won't accept the stories. Uh, th there is often a, a, a little bit of a hypocrisy. And just lastly, we, we do have to see a difference between the Rohingya issue and, and, and the Muslim issue in, in Burma. Sure, they're interrelated, uh, but, they, but, but the Rohingyas are a distinct Muslim community. Um, yeah. Hi. <coughs> mm, thanks very much for taking the time to share your views. I'm Sam 
I work for a bank and we look at financing uh, natural resources projects, uh, hence my interest in Burma. Um, I was just thinking about uh, foreign policy and in, in my socialistic mind that's broken up into um, economics and politics and politically I can see why it makes sense for Myanmar to connect with ASEAN. Um, but economically, uh, what, what sort of, um, I mean, why would, you know, Burma connect with, let's say, Vietnam, who has experienced this same kind of uh, uh, growth thing? Or, you know, I'm, I'm just seeing a sort of feeling that it might turn out like some parts of how the African countries react with each other, you know, ASEAN looking a bit like that. So just thoughts on this. No, no I, I think there are very good reasons why, why uh, they ought to be looking, uh, particularly on a micro level. I mean, you know, we see the big, you know, harvester, uh, caterpillar, and all the rest wanting to get in, but there's so much of what Burma needs is, is, is at a micro level. From from Vietnam, they can learn a lot in the rice industry, and in fact, uh, in the mid uh, two, 2006, they sent a delegation to, to Hanoi to learn about how to deal with the rice industry uh, and, 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 and the Vietnamese government said get friendly with the US so they packed up overnight and left uh, now of course it's different so I think there are lots of things they can learn the fact that there, there is there's, there's systems of, of uh, support for interconnectivity uh, you know and, and so on so, so I, think, I think there are useful economic benefits but, 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 and I don't believe Burma will, will, will isolate itself simply to looking at ASEAN. It will also look at the rest of the world. But, but I think, it, I, th I personally feel it's, it's actually a good policy and, and, and maybe not on the, on, the, on the major industry, you know, oil or telecoms, but on, on, particularly on agricultural policy, there's a lot to learn from the rest of, of, of ASEAN. Michael Matisse and the Visiting Fellow from the European Union here at the school, very interesting. Uh, you mentioned some of the, the neighbours and uh, countries. I was interested in what is the perception in uh, Burma Myanmar of the US role and the European Union's role. The President has been received recently <coughs> in Washington DC, red carpet treatment also in Brussels. And if I may say, the European Union has lifted its sanctions. In fact, they were suspended last year, they were lifted in in, in April, so apart from the arms embargo, the, the sanctions are lifted. So I think there the European Union is a bit ahead of the United States, but maybe I'm not correct. But what's the perception of, of these countries also compared to what was just said about Pakistan? <coughs> Yeah, I, I mean the, the sanctions is 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 is, is, a, is always a, a ticklish question. You know, I tell you, uh, for the Burmese leaders that I have spoken to, the fact that the EU suspended first its sanctions, uh, and in reality they they, it, they they were they'd lifted. They thought you were just um, you know you had cold feet. Um, there's a certain amount of hypocrisy. Um, uh, I, I uh, there's no doubt that as far as as far as Napy Dawes concerned, the U.S. is the big one. You know, that's you know they're the ones who have been the obstacle to so much. They're, they're the ones they want back in, uh, not just economically but militarily. You know, Min Ong Line, as the Australian uh, who actually wrote a little thing on the back uh, back of our book, uh, um, Andrew South said, you know, uh, Min Ong Line has wet dreams about about getting training back in in in, in the state. So I think it's true. Um, so so the, the, there's no question that you know as far as, as far as far as um, uh, they're concerned, uh, Washington is key. Now, they have a different attitude to the Chinese, and the Chinese understand the EU is a block, uh, and, and, and it's an important block that they can use to counterbalance Washington. The Burmese don't see the EU as the EU. They see it as France, Germany, England, uh, Britain. Uh, I do have Scottish ancestry. Um, <laughs> But but as, as as far as they're concerned, you know they they, they don't they don't spend a lot of time thinking about these things. If you're there to help, then we'll take your help. Uh, but it, uh, but it sh it has to be on our terms. Um, so they're mu you know they're much they're much more open. Uh, you know um, they, you say the EU was the first. I mean, for the Burmese point of view, the establishment of the of the American ambassador. 
um, was, was actually a very important symbolic step. Um, the EU came later by opening its, its, its office. Um, but it, it, it's, it's irrelevant. You know, um, they want good relations with everybody. No, I know, but, but the sanctions in the mind. You talk to British businesses. Anyway. I've... Okay, last question. We're uh, pretty much out of time. So. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Myanmar wants to, uh, to, does not want to rely uh, on China too much. Uh, but actually, China is the biggest investor. China is the biggest investor in, in Myanmar. And uh, as I know, because of the anti uh, China, China actions, uh, actually last year, China's investment uh, in Myanmar dropped uh, dramatically. And this year also uh, continued to drop. But actually, uh, under at this situation, uh, Myanmar needs uh, foreign investment, uh, needs uh, to, uh, to uh, open its market to the world. So uh, if the situation continues uh, like this, I mean, uh, China's investment continue to decrease and also uh, because of sanction has not been lifted and other investment uh, they are not go to Myanmar uh, at this moment I mean uh, so so in this case uh, in your feeling how uh, Myanmar will adjust its uh, policy uh, to, to, to China China's policy just a word yeah, go okay um the Chinese will be back, um, for sure. I mean, there's a new ambassador right now in, in, uh, in, in Rangoon, and he's really reaching out to everybody. Uh, and already, when you look at um, the state-owned enterprise, the Chinese state-owned enterprises, they're all trying to come with new Western uh, uh, philosophies, and, and, and there are talks of corporate social responsibility uh, among the Chinese um, uh, investors right now. Um, I'm pretty sure that the, the, the Chinese will try to reinvest back, uh, and, and, and Burma will have to deal with it. Uh, that's the logic of geography. I mean, this is the, the, the north. Burma is, is organized according to a north-south corridor, so which is um, uh, linking Yunnan and, um, and the Indian Ocean. It's far more difficult to cross uh, India through, uh, from India into, uh, um, into Southeast Asia. So the logical uh, organization and structure of the country is a north-south. That means that China is in the best position to, to benefit from him and from this position. And, 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 and Burma will have to deal with this, especially from um, um, uh, companies from, from Yunnan. So um, the Chinese have been puzzled by the Mitsong Dam um, issue. Uh, uh, but um, in, in a few in few years' time, you will, you will see the invest, Chinese investment rising in, um, in, in the country uh, for sure. They will just have to to readapt to uh, to the new uh, to the new context. But don't worry, they will be back. <coughs> no, I completely agree with with uh, with Renault. And I've spoken to a lot of uh, Chinese investors in, in Burma. Uh, and and uh, I mean, the area that's quite important is, not, is 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 small investment. I mean, in Shan State in particular, they're investing in small little industries. Uh, and 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 uh, they. While, while they they may be a bit shy, uh, they haven't withdrawn their investment, um, and and uh, and and there will be a, 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 an accommodation in in the future. There's no no doubt in my mind. What's important is to make sure from, uh, that that actually when things begin to develop, it's it's a level playing field, not only for Chinese investors but for other foreign investors. Uh, and I think that is going to be the reality that anyone wanting to invest in Burma uh, will have to deal with. Uh, and it won't be such a problem for European com companies or, 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 or Western companies. It's going to be a problem not just for Chinese companies, for Thai companies, for Vietnamese companies who all felt that their closeness to a minister or so on had given them special privileges. I think that those days are over. Okay, well, uh, let me call it uh, to an end. It's 1.35. Um, I just want to make three points. Uh, I think the first, uh, I agree a lot that the India-China competition in Burma has been overplayed. It seems to me probably the United States, the EU, and uh, Japan will be much bigger competitors for China in, in Burma. 
uh, the Indians, I think, uh, know they can't compete and, and they're not in it really very seriously to compete. I think the second uh, point is really a question, which is whether there's a, still a, a pro-China faction within the military that could make a comeback and, you know, uh, I'm just building on what you say, that whether there's a group there that, uh, as time goes on, will uh, assert itself and, and bring Burma back to a more uh, pro-Chinese stance. Um, and, and lastly, I mean, drawing on the Pakistan parallel, again, a question, are there elements of the, of the Burmese military in business? Because the Pakistani military is heavily in uh, business and whether that will impact the kind of foreign policy choices they make as well. But I'll just leave that as a question. You're nodding in a sort of yes, so <laughs> no. perhaps that's your brief answer to the question. Yeah. But, um, let me just thank uh, our two speakers uh, uh, on behalf of all of you, and uh, thank you for coming. By the way, I should have mentioned the books published by NUS Press in collaboration with uh, IRASEC, which is the Research Institute on Contemporary Southeast Asia. It's a French institute, uh, I think, so uh, it's a joint production. It's a very handsome volume. Rush out and buy it. Um, <laughs> Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy.